before we uh, dive into the, the, uh, the sermon tonight, which is based on, I don't know, the theme of Jesus, <laughs> the gift of Jesus. It's not based on any one of the specific passages we've read. And actually, we're going to look at some verses from uh, John chapter 4 here in a minute as well. But I do want to take just a moment and acknowledge all the people who put in time and effort to lead music. Some of them are leading this morning because today not only is Christmas Eve, it also is the fourth Sunday in Advent. That's just the way the church calendar year lined up this, this year. And a lot of people are pulling double duty this morning and tonight. And I just want to show our appreciation for all those who are leading tonight. So thank you very much. There are, we have three staff people uh, here at the church who are um, in, in worship music, the music worship side of things. All the rest you see tonight, though, are, are volunteers, so I'm really grateful for the time that they've uh, put in. By the way, what was the name of the piece you two played? J- uh, Carry a Torch, Jeanette and... Isabella. I don't know who Jeanette and Isabella are, but that was a beautiful song. That I really, I know there's some different hymns that were mixed in there that I recognize too, but... Um, yeah, that was great. Well, tonight we're actually starting, um, the message is the beginning of a new sermon series that we're, we will carry on for the next few weeks into the new year. Uh, what might Jesus say to, and then we'll look at a different person uh, each week. Tonight is Santa Claus. Uh, on the 31st of December, we'll take just a, a brief break, actually. Pastor Rob will preach. Pastor Rob would have been here tonight as well. He was supposed to read one of the scripture passages, but he is home sick and is not here. But on the 31st, presuming he's healthy enough, uh, he's preaching a special end of the year Christmas or a New Year's Eve type of message on Sunday at our 10 a.m. service. If he's not well by then, uh, I don't know, I'll come up with something that morning and we'll wing it. Um, Anyway, so then on the 7th, we're looking at what might Jesus say to the Beatles. The 14th, what Jesus might say to the Time Magazine Person of the Year for 2023, Taylor Swift. Any Swifties in the house here? Okay. And on the 28th, (laughs) on the 28th, the most famous person any of us know, and that is what might Jesus say to you, to to each and every one of us. So I just want to enjoy and invite you to join us for any or all of those Sundays. But tonight we look at what Jesus might say to Santa Claus. I doubt that Santa needs much of an introduction, but here's just a little background that probably some of us are familiar with, maybe some of you aren't. The current image of Santa as a jolly fellow in a red outfit and white beard and white trim and all that has been around since at least the 1800s, if not earlier. For instance, in 1823, Uh, Clement Clark Moore published a little poem that was originally titled A Visit visit from St. Nicholas. It begins with these words, "'Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a... Ah, You all know it. What am I doing standing here? Uh, Great. So that was in 1823. But the roots of Santa go back even further to the original Saint Nicholas, a real guy who lived in what is modern-day Turkey, a 4th century Christian. Uh, He was famous for his generosity toward the poor, giving them gifts in the name of Jesus so that they could have better lives. Today, while Santa is primarily celebrated through uh, European and North American culture, people throughout the world are familiar with Santa what he looks like, and his gift-giving tendencies, habit, job, whatever you want to call it. In fact, it may be that no other person, real or imagined, is as recognizable as Santa when it comes to at least you know, the physical image, what he looks like. You know, the white beard, the red hat, and all that. Like, that's pretty universally known. He is acknowledged as one who loves children, brings good gifts, and spreads good tidings of joy, except when the gifts are useless, such as hair dryers and clothes from the big and tall store. At least, I have no use for that. But Santa has overshadowed Christmas to the point that many people don't actually know why Christmas exists outside of him and the giving of gifts. And this is true Uh, including just in our own neck of the woods, like in North American culture and especially here as well. 
So an excerpt from one of my favorite books uh, illustrates this. The book is titled Lost in America. It's written by a pastor named Tom Clegg. And he relates an experience he had. And this is, you can kind of tell, because if they'd had smartphones, you know the story would have ended differently. It was pre-smartphone, pre-internet, what we know. I think this is from like the early 1990s. So, you know, three decades ago, basically. Which makes some of us feel really old all of a sudden. So here's what, he's, here's what he writes. One evening after a speaking engagement in Peoria, Illinois, I didn't feel sleepy. I saw a Barnes & Noble bookstore. Remember those? Uh, Barnes & Noble bookstore outside my hotel window, so I wandered over, ordered my usual coffee drink, rambled through the bargain section, and sat down in an armchair to read. At a table nearby sat six university students, so, you know, 18 to 22 years old kids. Um, they were hotly debating a trivia question. What was the skipper's name on Gilligan's Island? How many of you don't even know what Gilligan's Island is? Any? My, like all my kids just raised their hand and a bunch more too. As their debate went on, I leaned over and said, I know. This is this guy, the, the Tom Clegg, writing this. They all stared at me waiting for the answer. Here was my moment to find value in all the time I had wasting watching television in junior high. <laughs> I explained that his full name had appeared only in the very first show, the pilot episode, and then two others. Actor Alan Hale played the skipper. His character's name was... Does anyone know in here tonight? Just the skipper, right, yeah. His, the name of his character beyond just the skipper, his full name was Jonas Grumby. Aren't you glad you learned that tonight? <laughs> Slack-jawed, they responded, you must be really old. <laughs> I scooted up to their table and we began talking. They chatted with me about my life and I asked them about theirs. By midnight, I discovered that not one of these kids, college kids, could identify the historical significance of Easter. This is in the mid-1990s, early 1990s, in America, like just above the belt buckle, Bible belt buckle part, right? Peoria, Illinois. Two could do Christmas, but the other four of them didn't understand why anyone would celebrate the birth of a mythical Jewish carpenter. All of them had zero cultural connection with who Jesus is, why churches exist, and what authentic Christians do or believe. In other words, for these intelligent, educated, college students, Christmas was all about Santa and gift giving. I would love to know what they thought Easter was, like why the bunny and the eggs and all that, right? So what might Jesus say to Santa, this person who just dominates Christian, or, uh, Christmas culturally? The reality is there could be any of a number of things, what Jesus actually would say. So I'm suggesting what he might say. Could be other things that you could throw in here. But I think he might say something that would be uh, stemming from and connected to what Jesus once said to a woman that he met at a well outside of her village. Jesus and his disciples were on their way into that neck of the woods. They got to the well. Jesus was thirsty and hungry. He sent the disciples on ahead to get some food while he waited there for somebody to maybe come out and get, uh, help him get some water because he didn't have what was necessary for it. So this woman shows up. She'd had a, experienced a lot of pain in her life. She had been divorced several times. She was living in shame because of her relationship with her current boyfriend. Her identity was completely aligned with the shame that she had, that the town cast upon her, and the judgment that people had toward her. So she goes to the well outside of town to get water at midday when it's hot outside and no one else would be venturing that way at that point in hopes of not running into everyone, anyone, almost certainly. But Jesus is there. It's like he had this appointment with her and she didn't know it was going to happen. He asks her for a drink of water and it leads to a conversation where Jesus later says this. He says to her, everyone who drinks this water, meaning the water in the well, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. 
Indeed, the water I give them will well up in them to, uh, uh, will well up, uh, become in them a, we- a spring of water welling up to eternal of life, uh, uh, eternal life. So this is a conversation that starts out about physical water that we drink. Hey, I'm thirsty. Can you get me a cup of water out of the well? And ends up as a conversation with water as a metaphor for our spiritual vitality and our identity. How we identify, what we believe about ourselves and who we are. His invitation to her ultimately is to find her identity in him. Not in what everyone says about her. Not about her past. Not even her present relationships. Just to find it in him. John goes on to tell us that in spite of her shame, because of the labels that were cast on her by the community in which she lived, she goes back into town tells everyone she bumped into this guy named Jesus. He knows everything about me. And I want you all to come out and meet him. And the upshot of it is that Jesus ends up staying a couple of days and they end up believing. It says that many in town believed and acknowledge him as the Messiah, as the Savior. And it all starts with Jesus' invitation to her to find her identity, not in what others say about her or how she's living her life, but instead to find her worth, her value, and her identity in him. All the other stuff just obscures what Jesus has to offer. And so I think Jesus might say something like this to Santa, kind of keying off of his conversation with her. I think he might say something like, Mr. Claus, he would be polite like that. You bring much happiness into people's lives, but I want to challenge you to give them a gift that helps them find their true, lasting value, worth, and identity in relationship with me. Help them know that they are loved and can find lasting hope, joy, love, and peace in me. Now, I don't know what each of you are facing. I certainly know, you know, some of you have conversations, see you on Sundays, talk during the week or whatever as your pastor. I don't know what each of you are facing, though, or what you're going through in life right now. Maybe some of you kind of resonate with this gal who met Jesus and resonate with her story in some way, shape, or form. I do know that there is incredible pressure here on the east side in school and in work to succeed and to find our identity right there. Some of us maybe find our identity in financial wealth, our accumulation in our bank accounts and in our stuff and all that we have. Raising kids is tough. It's a very consuming process and it's easy for parents to find their identity in doing that. How many people, when they become empty nesters, they look at each other across the dinner table and like, Oh my goodness, who are you and what are we going to do? Cancer or other health things can threaten your quality of life or even life itself. And finding our identity in our physical bodies is a major temptation. Maybe your identity is bound up in some other relationship and how people view you and treat you. A spouse, a former spouse, a neighbor, a coworker, fellow student, someone else. Life can feel like an emotional yo-yo when these are the places where we gain our sense of worth and our identity. They aren't consistent. They ebb and flow. But Jesus offers something else, and that is this never-ending supply of water, in the spiritual sense, that brings value and worth because you are are loved by him, and get this, with an unchanging love. It's an unchanging love. It doesn't go away just because something in your life changes. His love stays there. It is constant. It is this love of his that brought him to the manger, his birth that we celebrate here on the 25th of December, And would later lead him to the cross. That's what his love ultimately leads him to do. In other words, Jesus gives you and me a whole new identity. Child of God. 
loved by him. Loved by your heavenly father, loved by Jesus, loved by the Holy Spirit that dwells in you when you come to a place of faith in Jesus. This is his gift to you. This is his gift to you. You don't have to earn it, work for it, pay for it, stress out about whether it's true for you or not. It's not a gift you have to go and buy and give to your spouse to wrap and give to you. We've talked about that. This is the third term in a row where I've mentioned that. It started two Sundays ago. It is his gift to you, and you can receive that gift anytime. It doesn't even have to be at Christmas. But this is when we may be most, uh, what's the word I'm looking for right now? Concentratedly, most focusedly, think about this. Think about Jesus coming to us as a gift. And I think to a certain degree, we all realize this about Jesus, right? We realize that this is what Christmas is about, that it's not really about all the other stuff, as fun as that stuff is. We're here tonight because we know Christmas is not just about gifts and trees and Santa and flying reindeer and all the other stuff that comes with it. We're here to be reminded that the identity of Christmas is found in Christ. It's not called giftmas. It's not called Santamus. I, those are the only two I came up with. You could come up with more, I'm sure. It's Christmas. Christmas. It's spelled C H R I S T Mus. Christ Mus. It is centered on Him. It is all about the gift of Jesus that God has given. And yet, Jesus can be totally obscured by all the other stuff, like Santa and His gifts. That happens this time of year. It, Jesus can be obscured so much by the rest of the year by so much other stuff as well. And it's all stuff that beckons, absolutely beckons you and me to find our identity in it. All that stuff that obscures us from Jesus. There's a story that's told. I'm going to tell two stories and then we'll wrap this up. Uh, the first one's long, the second one's very short. There's a story about a mother who was running fiercely from store to store on Christmas Eve uh, with her three-year-old son trying to find last-minute gifts. On Christmas Eve, can you imagine? None of us have any shopping to do tonight, right? Right? Amazon, next day delivering anybody? At one point, she realized she'd lost track of her three-year-old. In a panic, she retraced her steps, looking everywhere. She finally found him Here's another uh, sign that this story is old, older than probably early 1990s. She finally found him gazing at a manger scene in the picture window of a big department store. When was the last time that happened? When the boy heard his mother call his name, he turned and shouted in innocent glee, Look, Mommy, it's Jesus! Baby Jesus is in the hay! The frazzled mom grabbed his arm and jerked him away, kind of snapping at him, and said, we don't have time for all that. Can't you see mommy's trying to get ready for Christmas? <laughs> and off they went, leaving Jesus behind as they filled their lives up with all the other stuff, completely distracted from Jesus. I have no idea if that story is true or not. This one is. I recently read a true story about a young man from Malawi, Africa. Uh, a year ago or so, he was spending his first Christmas in America, down in Arizona, with a, a church that we have kind of a circuitous connection to through some missionaries we support. Anyway, this guy from Malawi is in Arizona and spending his first Christmas in America ever. He was asked in a Sunday church service, did a little interview with him, about, and one of the questions was just, I think, kind of off the cuff, about how he was enjoying his first Christmas in America. And here's what he said. He said, it's very different here. In Malawi, Christmas is mostly about Jesus. It's very different here. In Malawi, Christmas is mostly about Jesus. It's kind of a sad commentary on what Christmas has been about here. I would love to hear 
his thoughts, as I mentioned earlier about those college students, I'd love to hear his thoughts on Easter as well. We are so indoctrinated with the cultural Christmas that we don't even realize how much Jesus has been obscured by it all. And this is really still the challenge for each and every one of us, not letting the stuff of the world pull us away from him or clouding our view of the one who gives us, who gives you your identity. Coming to Jesus like the shepherds and the wise guys, but not just to the baby Jesus that we celebrate at Christmas, but also to the grown up, crucified and resurrected Jesus. Like the woman at the well. The others who followed Jesus in his lifetime and became the nucleus of the church at his resurrection. We need to come to him and stand before him like they did. Or with our eyes fixed on him like the little boy at the department store and find our true self in him. And just be overjoyed that we get to see Jesus. This is the invitation that Jesus gives us to find our true identity. Like the woman at the well who was given a false identity by the people around here, but given a new one by Jesus as she came to face to face with him, so he can also do with you. You, if you don't know this already, cling to this one thing tonight. You are a child of God, loved deeply by your heavenly father. It's absolutely why he gave you Jesus, so that you would know him and come to faith in him, so you might understand your relationship with your creator. You are beloved. And just as Jesus said to the woman at the well, and he might say to Santa, he invites you this evening and this Christmas to cease finding your worth and identity in the things of the world, and instead find your identity and your worth in Jesus Christ, in Jesus the Messiah. He invites you to cease finding your identity in what others say about you, be it praise or condemnation. He invites you to cease finding your identity in your work or your scholastics or your finances or your health or your hobbies or your relationships or whatever else may suck you in and beg you to find your identity in them. And instead, he invites you, as he did with this woman, to find your true self in him. Whether you have opened the gift before and received Jesus or not, I pray that this Christmas, even tonight, you would receive the gift of Jesus and find your identity as a child of God, a child of your heavenly Father, deeply loved by him. Let's pray. Gracious and holy God, thank you for this gift of Jesus that is the reason we gather. It is the reason we have this holiday, this holy day. And yet, Lord, it has become so much other stuff. Lord, help us to stay focused on Jesus, not just here tonight, but tomorrow. And not just tomorrow, but the day after. And then the day after that, and the day after that, and so forth and so on. And Lord, help us to stay in close connection to you, our Heavenly Father, realizing that because of the gift of Jesus, we have this identity as a child of you, a child of God. May we know you as our Heavenly Father, our Creator, the one who loves us to the point that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Lord, help us to understand that and come to that place of faith. We pray all of this in the life-giving name of Jesus, the name of the person who gives us a new identity. And all of the church said together, amen.